For many, time spent outside in the fresh air on an idyllic summer's day is likely to conjure up countless memories of being enveloped by nature in all its wonder and awe. Perhaps your recollection is of the glorious British countryside, your own secret garden, or even particular pleasantly perfumed flowers filling the air with their divine aroma as the warm breeze carries their delicate scents to the nose. Either way, while we are always quick to idle our sun-filled time away in each other's engaging company, there is a group from the animal kingdom that takes a completely different approach to life in the outdoors. The bees. This is their story. The well-known murmuring hum of bees is without doubt one of the telltale signs that summer has once again finally arrived. From early spring until the end of the summer months, bees can be seen hard at work, gathering enough pollen and nectar to feed their growing colonies and young before the seasons inevitably change and blooms once again fade. But they're not just gathering pollen and nectar to make honey and feed their young. Seen busily darting from flower to flower, they also play an important role in keeping our whole ecosystem in order. Well, I think bees are pretty fundamental to uh, a life, and certainly life as we know it. Um, uh, if we didn't have bees, then whilst we, we wouldn't necessarily go hungry, certainly our diets would be pretty boring. Um, we would be able to have rice and wheat and barley and all those grains. So if you like porridge, you're, you're going to be OK. Um, you might not be able to put honey on your porridge. Um, all the things that kind of make life bearable, uh, food-wise, are things that pollinators, bees, not just bees, but bees particularly, uh, have a really important role in putting on our plates. These are hugely important as pollinators in their own right. I mean, some of our supplies rely heavily on bees. I was at a greenhouse uh, that provides all of Waitrose's tomatoes and peppers, and they have thousands of, uh, of bumblebees doing the pollination. And so without those, those plants wouldn't fruit, we wouldn't get the supply we need, um, and therefore customers wouldn't get the tomatoes that they love from us. So that's just one example, but across the whole range of all the fruit and veg that we sell, pollinators are hugely important in maintaining the output that farmers need and then bringing that supply chain to fruition for, for Waitrose customers. For thousands of years, mankind has had a fascination with bees. The honeybee, Apis mellifera, is possibly the best known of all the bees today because, as its name suggests, it produces delicious honey which we have learned to exploit to our advantage by keeping beehives. The honeybee lives in colonies. Anyone who knows a little about the honeybee can't help but be amazed, because far more goes on inside the hive colony than most would ever imagine. There are complex communications, social interactions, teamwork, unique roles and responsibilities, food gathering, and the engineering of one of the most beautiful natural places to live, the comb. 
which not only stores honey and pollen crops, but also facilitates the growth of young. Apiary, or beekeeping, is an immensely rewarding hobby. In London, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of apiarists in recent years. The London Beekeepers Association reported an increase of just over 1,700 registered bee colonies over a four-year period between 2008 and 2012. So why are so many people now becoming interested in managing bee colonies? Well, um, I'm involved with um, Hackney Community Tree Nursery. Back in 2008, we started to think about uh, whether we would keep honeybees. Um, and I went on a familiarisation day at Hackney City Farm. And then a year later, we got started with the support of the person who taught that course. What interested me was, was the biology of the bees, actually. Um, I'm very interested in, in natural selection and how it works um, and what it produces. And um, they are an astonishing organism. Uh, and uh, we still know, there are still an awful lot of things that we don't know about them. And current research is extremely interesting. Well, I got kind of interested when I was about 10 and I saw what we call an observation hive, so it's like a hive that's behind glass. And I sort of like, I've always been fascinated by sort of like nature and stuff, but it's kind of just kind of clicked, so I've always been interested in them, um, but never had anywhere to keep them. And then, sort of about 12 years ago, sort of this opportunity came up at the farm and they wanted bees here so we thought alright oh, okay we'll put some bees here so that's how we got started really and then we we'll kind of look back. I think it's just the fascination of kind of watching the, the, the colony develop through the year and sort of how it, how it relates to the seasons and stuff like that and it's just a way of um, kind of having, having livestock. Upstairs we've got, I think it's five hives at the moment. As the bees swarm, you end up with slightly more colonies and then you'll merge colonies that are maybe a bit weak back together again. So the number does change, but at the moment we've got about five. But a honeybee colony can't really be considered as a number of individual bees. Instead, the bees, which are seen in volumes as large as 40 or 50,000 during the summer months, will work together in what was termed a superorganism by the anthropologist Alfred Marshall. Bees adopted the highest level of biological, social and hierarchical organisation known to man. The basic elements of the superorganism are not formed of tissues and cells as we may instantly imagine, but instead a number of closely cooperating individuals. As a result of this way of life, Apis mellifera, the honeybee, ensures an almost uninterrupted existence. The honeybee produces three, it's got three sexes, which are called castes. Um, the workers are female and in normal circumstances they don't lay eggs. Um, the queen is the egg layer for the colony and that's what she does. And the drones are, if you look at the super, as the superorganism, they're the testes of the colony, right? Um, they are actually cloned, genetically they're clones of the queen. They are produced from unfertilized eggs. Um, and they are haploid, which means they only have one chromosome, uh, as opposed to diploid, which the workers are. Um, so you have to look at the superorganism structure. Uh, the queen is the ovaries, the drones are the testes, and the workers are everything else, all the other body cells. Um, and the mating occurs between 
for between um, colonies, the queen doesn't mate with her own drones because obviously there would never be any genetic progress in that case. As for worker roles, okay, workers will move through a series of, of tasks and roles during their existence. And the bees have different roles depending on their age. So as they, the bee develops from emerging from the, 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 the brood, different glands and organs develop at different rates and that then um, defines what jobs they can do within the hive. They become what's called house bees. So they will um, tidy up. <laughs> they will be um, cleaning out cells after grubs have emerged from them. They'll move on then to nursing grubs, feeding them with um, nectar and with secretions from the glands in their heads. Uh, there's, there's a dozen or more roles which they progress through. Another important one is, is um, guarding the hive entrance. And then at the end of, towards the end of their life, the last two to three weeks, they graduate to being um, foragers. And you'll see the new foragers um, learning to navigate. They, well, they start by hovering in front of the hive. And they're, they're memorizing what the hive looks like so they can find it. Um, then they'll sort of loop in figures of eight, so they're looking at the local landscape. And then um, they will go off on their first foraging expeditions. The reward of collecting crops of honey and useful other products from the beehives is an obvious attraction of having a beehive of your own, but it is by no means the only reason people are attracted to apiary, because we have recognised that bees actually offer an entirely different gift. Pollination Pollination is the fertilisation of flowering and fruiting plants by the transfer of pollen grains, which allows them to produce fruits, nuts and vegetables. Without the bee's help, many plants, and also potentially agricultural crops, would suffer dramatic consequences, likely illustrating vast declines in population or productivity. Any gardener will recognise the value of pollinating insects. They perform an absolutely essential service in the production of seeds and fruit. Not only this, but plants all rely upon pollination for their survival. Approximately 60% of all the fruit and vegetables which are consumed by us require pollination by bees. Research into agriculture estimates that without all the helpful bee species, it will cost farmers over £1.8 billion per year to pollinate their crops in other ways. Put more simply, one mouthful out of every three of the food and drinks we consume is as a result of plants that have been pollinated by bees. I mean, the, the sort of hype, if you like, is that honeybees pollinate practically everything. Um, and the more I read about it, the more doubtful I am about that. If bees weren't also out there pollinating not just crops, but wildflowers, trees, hedgerows, um, then our landscape would look very different. Um, and that would have a knock-on effect on other species, whether it's insect species or bird species. And so you're then looking at the whole food chain and the animal chain. So um, I think that's another reason why, beyond the food concern, the, the functioning of our natural environment is a really important consideration to get right if we, if we want to um, uh, kind of keep things as they are, as we, the green and pleasant land we, we like to think we live in. Well, we see not just bees but pollinators generally as uh, really important for the long-term sustainability of farming, the ecosystems that support agriculture and maintaining productivity outputs for the long-term future of food supply. There's some 
interesting work done by a man called Dave Goulson, um, who's a bumblebee specialist. And uh, he's, he's done a lot lately to publicize the, the importance of bumblebees in pollination. There are crops which honeybees simply can't pollinate because they don't have long enough tongues. Or in the case of tomatoes, they don't have the, the buzz pollinating technique which bumblebees apply. <laughs> So although most of us will immediately think of Apis mellifera, the honeybee, when we're asked about bees, it's not just the one species that is invaluable to our delicate ecosystem. There is a whole array of other native British wild bees which also play their own vital role in sustaining the ecosystem. There's about 280 species of bee in Britain, um, of which one is the honeybee. Um, then you've got about 25 species of bumblebee, and the rest are predominantly solitary bees. Um, they are a notoriously difficult group to identify, other than a few species that you can do in the field by looking at them with a hand lens. It's microscopy and quite complicated um, keys to, to to actually distinguish individual species. Britain has 267 species of bee. It's not just the honeybee, that's one species. Then there are about 23, 24 species of bumblebee and the rest are all solitary bees that live alone. They don't produce honey for us, but they're really important for pollinating crops, particularly things like uh, fruits and apples. So if you like apple pie or cider, um, you know, you need to stand up for the solitary bee. There's, there's a lot of bees which will take pollen from various plants, but there are many that are very specific. Across the whole range of all the fruit and veg that we sell, pollinators are hugely important in maintaining the output that farmers need and then bringing that supply chain to fruition. One of the things to distinguish is between forage and feeding, so the, the, the bees themselves will feed on nectar, but the forage is for pollen for the young, for the um, developing young and the larvae. So it's really with pollen that things become very specific um, and they'll be more general as regards nectar but even then access to nectar depends on the shape of the plant and the shape of the bee's tongue so um, some bees have special kind of evolutionary adaptations to have very long tongues and so they work particularly with long flowers but again there are exceptions so there are bumblebees which will bite their way into flowers uh, and steal honey uh, steal nectar so it's 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 quite complex but in recent years, there have been significant declines in the number of native wild bees in the United Kingdom. The bees are an essential part of, of our biodiversity. Um, they're an essential part of our food chain and a very, very important part of our economy. Um, and they're under threat. Since 1900, 20 species of wild bee have gone extinct. So that's a kind of quite a striking figure, actually. Uh, it's about one a decade. Um, roughly. Um, the, there was a big dip in, in um, colonies of managed honeybees and that's kind of started to recover and stabilise. Um, there are, of the bumblebees, there are about six that, that are doing generally okay. Um, I think the problem is that actually there isn't proper monitoring. You know, there is an army of amateur uh, insect lovers out there who do a great job spotting things at the weekend or in the evenings or whatever and trying to keep their own records but there isn't a national monitoring scheme so actually there isn't proper good data about what species are out there and what condition they're in and whether they're affected by different causes of bee decline. Various causes for the decline have been proposed as researchers look into the complexity of ecosystem balance and agricultural technique. Probably one of the most prevalent facts to come to light in recent months is that of neonicotinoid pesticide use. But as with all research, opinions quickly change. So what are the current views behind the decline of our native bees? The declines in honeybees are probably complex and specific to certain beekeeping and agricultural practices, um, which aren't fully understood. But Certainly honeybees seem to be very stressed by the way in which they're kept and moved around and, and the honey is harvested. And that combined with the very complex um, toxic combinations of, 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 of um, 
uh, insecticides and, and herbicides seems to be a significant factor for them. Yes, yeah, so the, the particular group of chemicals that's caused us to, uh, in to, during the time of the Bee Cause campaign are, are neonicotinoids or neonics. They're a particular form of chemical that uh, in, is used systemically on crops. It grows through the plant, it's not sprayed as such. Um, and uh, the, the reviews of the science as to these particular uh, chemicals is, is showing that they are a high acute risk to bees and they do need to be re-evaluated. For, for wild bees, um, the situation is again more diverse and more complex, but essentially you've got massive habitat loss with um, in, industrial and, and, and uh, intensified agriculture. Very few opportunities for bees to nest, to, to forage on the plants they want to forage on. Um, and so there are several wild bee species which have either become extinct recently or will are likely to become extinct in Britain in the near future. An example of the consequence of bee habitat loss could soon be seen on the eastern edge of the Abney Park Cemetery Nature Reserve in Hackney, London. It currently shares its boundary with a car park in Wilmer Place. And this site is currently um, subject to a planning application for a new Sainsbury's. Um, so the site is important because it bounders the cemetery. The boundary is about 100 metres long all the way uh, around this site. Um, and it is the one place where Abney Nature Reserve has an open woodland edge. There's a lot of permeability between the nature reserve and this site. Also, because this site is currently a car park, it's very, very open, so it's very warm, lots of sun, uh, and so the area along the boundary um, is an ideal woodland edge, which is a, a, a kind of prime habitat for insects and um, wildflowers. Of the 100 plus species we've identified so far on site, you're going to lose 80 to 90 uh, percent of those, probably pretty much overnight, um, and they won't come back. Um, and that's a key factor that, on the, in this case and in most cases, developers don't like to, to look at. You, the, the way the planning laws are uh, written at the moment, the only species they really have to consider are the European protected and nationally protected species under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So bees don't get a look in. To the untrained eye, this wouldn't necessarily look like particularly valuable habitat, it's just long grass. Um, but what you do have here is the fact that the cemetery being very close by it provides numerous resources, whether they're nectar or other habitat, uh, other nesting resources. And what this particular grass edge provides is a very warm um, ground nesting site for ground nesting bees. And so what you'll find if you look very carefully is little holes in the ground where ground nesting bees are nesting. So there's, they're quite hard to find and they're not very big. The diameter of the hole is probably under a centimetre. On a, on a warm day what you can see here is the uh, mining bees flying about coming back to the nests laden with pollen. They'll go down into the nest and maybe five minutes later they'll come back out with no pollen on them ready to go and collect some more for another net for another cell. With space at a premium in London, one thing is certain, building developments will always be proposed. So, how can we work together in the future to allow developments to go ahead, but also minimise disruption to sites of considerable biodiversity? There's no, no reason why the site has to remain exactly as it is. You can retain the habitat and put a new building here, but it has to be further away from the boundary. And that's a basic principle of managing any wildlife reserve, any nature reserve. Your boundary is important. Um, and it, the concept really is, is it best explained by the fact that a nature reserve isn't intended to be a zoo. You're not trying to keep the wildlife in. You're trying to provide a space for the wildlife so that it can then move and colonate uh, pop, populate other areas and if you build buildings all the way around it effectively you build a wall around it. The, the government in the UK put a lot of effort into researching the causes of uh, decline in managed colonies of honeybees. Um, they have about um, £600,000 a year they're spending on that and they have about 60 to 70 people working on it. Strangely enough they have only one person working part-time on bumblebees uh, or wild bees. 
Um, so that's something that needs correcting. Um, and I think as a result of that research, um, there is better knowledge now about how to um, improve conditions for managed colonies of honeybees. The same can't be said for wild bees, and that's crazy because wild bees are arguably more important, if not definitely more important for pollinating crops than honeybees. There are clearly distinct issues with the methods we have adopted to increase agriculture output. With so many people to feed, it's surely understandable that methods would change to cope with ever-growing demands. But the reason for the bee decline, it seems, isn't one that is as simple as resolving by just removing neonicotinoid pesticides from use in the United Kingdom. There are a large amount of people who are concerned about this rapid decline and what can be done to slow it and hopefully prevent any further bee species from extinction. We decided to run the Bee Cause campaign precisely because we thought, well, there are some good pieces of work being done by some other environmental charities and conservation projects. Bumblebee Conservation Trust, British Beekeepers Association, obviously for honeybees. But we, we looked at the problem, we thought, well, no one's running a campaign looking at all causes of bee decline and trying to run a campaign for all species of bee, not just honeybees, not just bumblebees. And that was new. The key issue, though, is about the systemic use of pesticides. And what we're trying to do is find alternatives, and we know the alternatives exist, and while some people would say those alternatives have other risks, as well. What we think, what we believe at the moment is that the precautionary point approach on neonicotinoids is merited and I think the EU activity supports that. Um, in June uh, 2013 we ran a massive bee summit. We brought all the key players into the room. They'd never met each other and we said right, we had the government there as well and essentially the government used that as an opportunity to announce that there will be a national pollinator strategy. In other words a bee action plan. Um, and that we're now trying to say, let's help devise that plan. Let's not leave it to the government, let's help crowdsource that plan if you like. Well, we contribute to research in a variety of ways. So we're, we're specifically uh, funding a new project at the University of Exeter, and that will be around um, pollinators, the impact of pesticides generally on pollinators, uh, and more broadly on how um, pesticide activity on, on farms is, is managed. Well, the, the, the aim of the, uh, of the Bee Friendly app was, was really to sort of generate um, more awareness amongst consumers. And what we wanted to try and do was engage consumers uh, to build their awareness, but also through a piece of citizen science, get them involved in gathering the data and giving an even bigger picture of the presence or absence of pollinators in their back gardens, on their window boxes, in the local park, wherever it might be, to say, no, this is what we are seeing. So the Bee app that you can download allows you to uh, identify uh, whether there are bees and different types of bees, butterflies and moths, um, other types of flies like hoverflies or beetles, where you're seeing them in your garden, what sort of plants you're seeing them on, and, uh, and, and the numbers. With charitable organisations such as Friends of the Earth and companies like Waitrose and The Co-op making such a stand in changing the future of British bees, the question can only remain, what are we each able to do to help change the current outlook for bees? Yeah, there's, there's lots you can do. Um, the key, probably, other than simply providing nectar and pollen resources, um, is having spaces which aren't too tidy. Um, compost heaps and areas of tweaks are quite good for bumblebees because, as I say, that's the sort of place you might get a wood mouse or a vole nesting. Um, and so the bumblebee will take over that nest. Um, equally, if you want to attract a lot of the stem nesting or uh, mason bees, just put a pile of um, sticks together. Bamboo twigs, anything that's hollow, um, got to be at least 10 centimetres long, um, stacked horizontally so as the bees can go in horizontally, and reasonably stable so it's not moving around, preferably in a warm south-facing place. Um, and then just having the right sort of space in your garden for either a bit of kind of sandy loose soil for the ground nesting bees or um, some brambles or um, raspberries for the cane nesting bees. So the bee campaign isn't over, we need to devise a really brilliant bee action plan or national pollinator strategy and then do it. But the strategy will give the clues to the public to say okay this is much more than just 
sowing some wildflowers, you know, a packet you got from a shop or somewhere, or off, a, off the back of a drinks can or something. It, it's got to, we've got to scale up, we've got to join up the range of action, we've got to share more information better, and that's all happening because and through the Fancy Earth Course campaign, which is great, great news, great news. So, it's clear that to help our native bees, we must think seriously about our interaction with the environment. It's about finding ways to change our behaviour that provides a sustainable solution for bees, not just for now, but most importantly for the many years to come. Where the bee sucks the onicotinoid incesticides in a cowslip's bell lie, in fields purple with lavender, the yellow with rape, and on the sunflower's upturned face, on land monotonous with cereals and grain, merrily, merrily, sour in the soil, sheathing the seed, systemic in the plants and crops, the million acres to be ploughed, seething in the orchards now, under the blossom that hangs on the bough.